Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Bitcoin is the, the world's uh, most popular cryptocurrency. Uh, it is now 10 years old. It was created by developers known under the pseudonym as Satoshi uh, Namato. <laughs> I knew I'd uh, mispronounced that. Nakamoto. But... Yes. And I have with me uh, tonight probably uh, the world's best Bitcoin educator, expert, uh, media personality, uh, Stefan Livera. <laughs> this. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I wouldn't say I'm quite the best, but uh, very flattering. Oh, well, your podcast, which is, well, it's it, it, it's under your name. It's it's over 100 episodes now. It's got basically a five-star rating. It's one of the most popular ones, Bitcoin podcasts uh, in the, the world. Uh, you speak at uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency conferences all over the uh, the globe. And of course, you're one of the founders of Ministry of Nodes, which is actually a, uh, a Bitcoin uh, education uh, organization, which I was just checking it out. You definitely need some sort of online academy, like how Tom Woods has Liberty Classroom, and of course there's Learn Liberty, and of course Jason Stapleton has his uh, Online Entrepreneur Academy. Is that something that's in the works? We've got, I mean, we're, it's, at, the, at this point it's just getting started with that, so we are thinking about different ideas on that. At this point it's more just like webinar coaching and also other materials like articles and YouTube uh, resources that will help a person take their own sovereignty in, you know, back into their own hands and use that to basically be a full, a fully fledged Bitcoin citizen, if you will. Well, you're going to be doing a bit of a, a webinar to, to me and my audience uh, tonight, because even though I've been uh, in the, the libertarian uh, scene for, for nearly a decade myself, and you and I met at the Australian Libertarian Freedman Conference, that was a number of uh, years ago, and because we're both uh, Austro-Libertarians, uh, we sort of gravitated towards that sort of social grouping at the, the conference, and we all got along like a house on fire, as as much as I recall. We just had yeah, chatted about, uh, obviously, the, the trends that were going on at the time, and yeah, uh, obviously, the, the Austrian, because... Austrian economics is just one school of libertarian uh, thought. There's there's obviously the Chicago uh, school, and there's a whole bu whole bunch of, of others. But yeah, uh, uh, Austrians they're they're very smart and entrepreneurial uh, people, and obviously they they they're not too concerned about optics. They they know that they they've always been the the outsiders. Yeah, there's definitely a bit of a sense of that. I think. From my point of view, there are a lot of insights that the Austrian school can bring and they can help us understand why Bitcoin is so important and help us understand Bitcoin from the right point of view. And that's why with my podcast, I really bring a lot of Austrian economics alongside the technical components, the computer science and those aspects of Bitcoin. And I sort of meld them together in the way that I interview my guests and some of my guests are Austrian economists and then some of them are more from the computer science, technical networking, distributed systems, that side of this world, as well as various you know business entrepreneurs within Bitcoin. So that's, yeah, but I, I think to your point around uh, Austro-libertarianism, yes, it's, it's only one part of the broader libertarian movement, if you will. I remember there were countless uh, sessions on, on Bitcoin at the various libertarian conferences I've attended over the years. It, it never really interests me just because it was all so technical and a geeky uh, uh, discussion. But uh, Bitcoin and the larger cryptocurrency uh, industry is is now as, as big, big as ever. And of course, the reason why Austrians and other libertarians are attracted to, to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because it's a, they're currencies which are not issued by the state uh, or a central uh, bank. Uh, they, you don't need to use a commercial uh, or merchant bank. And it also, it, it's 
a safeguard against uh, inflation, which of course is the, the secret tax, or we should call it a, a theft, because it's the, <laughs> obviously, you know, when your taxes are coming out of your paycheck, uh, but you don't know that uh, the, the dollars that you're holding in your hand are f slowly decreasing in value. And everyone, the, the, the standard thing is, oh, the price of Coke went up from $3 to $3.30. Oh, that's greedy Coke again. No, that's inflation. Yeah, so it's a... I'm actually puzzled why more libertarians are not into Bitcoin. You know, I sense that the, the people who are in Bitcoin, they generally, there's a high percentage of libertarians who are in Bitcoin. But I would say there's a large amount of libertarians who, maybe as you, you were getting to this point as well, because it's quite technical to understand Bitcoin. And so to some extent, I try to help break that down for people and help make that easier for them to understand. But the sad reality is right now it is a bit more technical and it takes a bit of work. It will eventually get easier and things will get abstracted away and it'll be happening all under the hood. It, a good analogy would be you use SMTP all the time. It's just that Gmail is handling that email protocol for you in the background and you don't have to worry about it. You just hit compose and off you go, right? You send your email. Same way with Bitcoin. It's not quite at that point yet where it's, you know, grandma can use it. There are efforts being made on it and it offers a incredible, it offers an incredible amount of freedom once you know how to use it. It takes a little bit of work though right now. I think, but my argument would be that work is worthwhile and more libertarian minded people and free speech minded people should be looking at Bitcoin and trying to learn about Bitcoin and trying to use it. Yes, because we've been covering at the Unshackled, the, the, the banking and financial deplatforming. Obviously, it began with, with uh, Patreon and PayPal deplatforming content creators who had the wrong opinions, and then it went to, to PayPal. And one of the things we've covered recently is a lot of Australian Patriot activists having their commercial bank accounts with ANZ and Westpac shut down, and the bank says, Oh, we, we have the power to shut it down, but we're not going to tell you why shift your money. We don't want to do the business with you again. And of course, bank, uh, tra everyone engages with uh, financial transactions or just any type of exchange. If you, if you want to bring it back to that basic Austrian economics, uh, uh, people exchange. Obviously, it began with the, the barter days direct exchange, then indirect exchange, and that's when money was developed as a, as a medium of exchange. And so we exchange goods and other, other, other forms of money every day. And I think some people, if they, well, they swipe their, their card at the, the supermarket and it's declined because not because there's no money in there, but be, apparently, apparently because they're the wrong thing, it's... Obviously, if that happened to you 30 years ago, there's not much else uh, you could do. And of course, these days, uh, I'm not sure if you've been following the, the cash ban, uh, $10,000 or more, it's going to be illegal to carry that uh, in in cash. So they're, they're cracking down on... Oh, <laughs> who would have thought the state would further regulate how you're allowed to use their currency? Yeah, th I mean, you make a lot of good points already. Uh, fundamentally, we are seeing creeping controls further kyc further aml sanctions laws as you mentioned currency capital controls use of things like you know, a ban on transactions above ten thousand dollars etc and the reality of it is that you know as uh, any of your listeners who have read hansom and hopper would know that the more things that are controlled by politics the more things just become like a political football right and so it just it's a natural creeping uh phenomenon where more and more things become politically determined where maybe when you and I were kids people could go to the football and it wouldn't necessarily be so pol politicized right but nowadays everything is politicized well now your money is getting politicized even further and so that is an angle and as, as I'm sure your listeners are aware that can be used as a vector to try and shut people down and sometimes it can be in a chilling effect sense as well because right now banks and other financial companies and financial services companies they live in fear of losing their banking license because if they lose their banking license it's game over and so typically then what happens is the government and the regulators basically 
deputize banks and other companies to do their bidding for them to say hey we want you to do x y and z a a aml controls we want you to do x y and z screening of transactions and then it starts to become this effect where banks sometimes aren't clear where they're allowed to play and so then they err on the safe side because they don't want to lose their license so then that's where they start doing this deplatforming aspect of it and that's where say visa and mastercard will then try and start applying pressure to people who are using Visa and MasterCard as a payment rail. And so then that's where some of this stuff happens where say Gab, you know, Gab has had problems with you know, many problems uh, with taking payments online and other industries as well. So whether that's drug industries or sometimes sex workers, other you know, for, for whatever reasons, and sometimes industries that are perfectly legal or even industries that are maybe in a more gray zone, depending on what you know country you're talking about. Well, victimless crime yeah. uh, industries, I think yeah. that's the best way to refer to them. Yeah, exactly. So any of these uh, victimless crime industries, they've often had issues, even if they are legal, to still get banking relationships and banking going. And so then they're stuck trying to deal with all these different payment processes, and some of them are a bit more on the dodgy side. Some of them will charge very high fees. Some of them will revoke the money, you know, there'll be chargebacks. There's all these other little components to it. And it's not so easy to just say, oh, use this other payment thing. So, but then that is where Bitcoin comes in. And so now with Bitcoin, people can use open source software such as BTC Pay Server, and they can then use that to basically set up and take payment in a way that's unstoppable. Nobody can stop that payment. And what? so that is an incredibly powerful thing. I'll stop you there. What is open source? Because it, it's got into everyday language now. For example, Signal, which is one of the, in, the encrypted messaging servers that's described as open, open source. What does it actually mean? Because this is, this is the aim of tonight, to sort of break down the, the jargon and have it explained. Great question. So open source refers to typically the code being open source, right? That's the key thing. The code, the software of that is available for anyone to review. They can just look it up online. And typically that might be on hosted on a website such as github.com or other, it could be hosted somewhere else. And the, I guess the important thing to understand is it's not just that literal, the code being open source, it's a certain ethos, right? So when Project, there are open source projects, and you'd be surprised. To, um, so some of your listeners not, might not be as technical, let's say, but amongst computer programmers, there are some of them who will work their day job at a normal, you know, full-time computer programming, software development, or you know, computer science job. But then at home, they'll go home and code for free. Why is that? Now the answer to that is that they enjoy contributing to some of these different projects because some of these different open source projects are really a passion project for them. Sometimes it's scratching your own itch. Sometimes they wanted their own calculator software or they wanted their own software to download podcasts with or whatever it is, or software to interact with Bitcoin. And so that is part of the, there's a certain ethos around open source and about contributing into that software. And then so with open source, one of the things that happens is it allows for the development of that code to be out in the open. And it allows for, in some ways, more security in, uh, by having more eyes on that code. It means more people can now look at that code. Now, yes, the downside is you need to have enough technical people who are looking at the code to give it that security, but that is one of the benefits. And so what you'll see is that sometimes proprietary closed source software that is, you know, you can't read that code, it won't be as easy to build on top of. Whereas open source software, like people can just sort of take these different components and they're sort of modular, if you will. You can like throw them together in some ways. And then that's one component that's been really powerful with Bitcoin. So I guess to sort of bring it back to Bitcoin being open source, it's that the, so fundamentally the code of Bitcoin is open source. All the development happens out in the open. So there's an open mailing list with thousands of people on it and they will contribute ideas to that mailing list. They will say, oh, what if we developed this feature or that feature? But then it might be debated from a technical point of view. Someone else might say, no, I disagree. We can't have that because that opens up a security vulnerability this way, that way, etc." And then the, the way it works is then that people will debate certain proposals and they may happen in different forums such as IRC, Internet Relay Chat, the mailing list as I mentioned, or directly on GitHub they may put comments 
on things, they may say, hey, what if we made a change to the code known as a pull request? What if I made a pull request to try and change that code to make it do this? Maybe I want to add a new feature or I want to try and change it to maybe, oh, I, I spotted a bug and here's a way to remove the bug from that code or something's malicious, uh, we need to fix that. So that's kind of in a high level what it does. But the, I think the more important point is, is to understand that ethos around open source and that it's it's less about having an expectation of someone else doing things for you, and but more just doing things for you know for the benefit of the community. And I know that sounds sort of socialist or whatever, but it's it's not like you can still be very capitalist about it, right? Well, it's yeah, it's voluntary, so, yeah. as uh, yeah uh, we we like to say, even though you're you're contributing something for for free, uh, there's often the expression "pay it forward," which pay it forward. You're not forced to pay it forward. It's an ethos. Uh, but I, mean, I don't think it doesn't sound socialist to me at all. It sounds like because this is the thing that Bitcoin, even though it was created through the so-called anarchy of the the internet, there's so much order and security around it. As the uh, expression goes, it's a beautiful anarchy. <laughs> yeah, right. I think that's a uh, Jeffrey Tucker, right? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think um, it. Yeah, so I, there's a few things here to understand. So there's a few different layers at play here, right? So the code that Satoshi Nakamoto wrote back in 2008 and 2009 or when uh, Satoshi published it, what's happened is the community took that on and they've continued developing and adding new features on top of new features on top of new features such that they have added more features to the system and also they've helped it scale to a certain level and they have helped keep it the system secure but understand that there's different layers here so think of it like the same way that you're you've got a computer and you might have you might be running windows or mac or linux that would be considered the operating system but then on top of that you can run different software right so in the same way bitcoin the underlying software, you can think of that like there's a, what we call consensus, you know, the protocol at a protocol level. And then there are other things like applications that interact with that protocol. So, for example, if you have a Bitcoin wallet uh, and then you, that wallet, speak, think of it this way, it knows how to interact with the Bitcoin protocol to, un to tell you, oh, Tim, this is what your balance is. Or, Tim, you would like to send 0.1 Bitcoin to someone else. That's that wallet helps you interact with the protocol in a way that makes it easy for you rather than you having to do everything on the command line yourself, if that makes sense. And that allows you to do other features such as using a hardware wallet. So any of your listeners who have Bitcoin, they might have, say, a Trezor or a Ledger, let's say, which are some common hardware wallets which help you secure your Bitcoins. Where would, because uh, I've heard, obviously, Bitcoin wallet that stores your, your Bitcoin, but how do you exactly get your hands on a wallet? Like, can you Google Bitcoin wallet and it'll give you like reliable ones? Because I've also heard uh, st stories about the people's Bitcoin wallets uh, disappearing, uh, not so much these days, but that was a, 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 a bug, if you, if you want to call it uh, a number of years ago. Yeah, so definitely there have been a lot of unscrupulous actors in the space who have used malicious software or tried to basically trick you into using some other big some other you know cryptocurrency which they fallaciously or you know in a tricking way they tried to call it bitcoin when really it was not bitcoin so if your listeners are interested some wallets that i would just name uh samurai wallet is a good one for android uh, Blockstream Green is a good one for iPhone or Android if you just want a you know, typical Bitcoin wallet. Uh, otherwise, there are some other ones. Dropbit, that's another one. Um, Zap is another one. So yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just a few off the top of my head. And uh, Electrum would be a good one for, for a desktop. But just note, Electrum is a little bit more of a power user wallet. Um, yeah, so I guess th there are a few just off the top of my head. But the key point to understand there is that it's very difficult in some ways to find high quality information in the space because there were a lot of people who basically had some alternative currency to shill to you or some questionable project to shill to people rather than trying to provide good, honest information. Yeah, and obviously, oh, 
I hope that that's sort of a... Like how this... Because obviously when I started the Unshackled, I used WordPress, which is a open source uh, 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 online uh, content management uh, system. And all these websites popped up over the years to, to give uh, advice and that. So obviously you've named a few there. Is is that something Ministry of, of Nodes is like doing sort of lists of who are the top 10 of... of Bitcoin wallets or other th uh, 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 other parts of the the industry. So, as part of our articles and so on, and we also have a YouTube channel where we ha have done some reviews of hardware wallets, for example. So, Ledger, Trezor, mm. Cold Card as well. So, Cold Card is currently my favorite in terms of hardware wallets, but yeah. So, we are planning to do some articles around that as well, and. Our main offering at the moment is the webinar, basically. So we understand that most people are busy. They don't have time to deal with these things. And it takes literally hundreds, if not thousands of hours to try and get pull this together. So what we're trying to do is basically pull it together into a way that's very easily digestible for people who've got jobs and families and hobbies and lives outside of Bitcoin. Let us help you with that. And we'll kind of coach you through and speed you through that learning curve. And obviously, uh, a well, another bit of jargon that's uh, talked about is is blockchain. Uh, so, can you give a beginner's introduction to, to to what it is and what are the benefits of it? Okay, so this is a very again can be controversial. Now, there are some. So you might have, uh, this narrative came in a couple a couple of years ago. It was like blockchain, not Bitcoin, right? So there was these people who were trying to talk about blockchain technology as though it was some amazing, incredible general purpose technology? The short answer is no, it's not. Now, let me just wind back a second and just give a rough high level of what blockchain is, right? So some people very simplistically will say, hey, it's just a chain of blocks, right? But the key point to understand with Bitcoin, and again, this gets, I don't want to go too into the detail around the cryptography and so on, but the basic idea is that each so Bitcoin is a network that has to maintain consensus in a distributed way without having any centralized party say, yes, this is the canonical block. Yes, this is the canonical update. So what it does is it uses cryptography in such a way that it's hard to basically bluff, if that makes sense. You can, you can check it very quickly, but it's hard to go reverse, if that makes sense. And so because of that, what it does is every block includes what's known as the hash of the prior block inside it. And then that is where this whole idea of the blockchain creating a canonical, sorry, a canonical ordering or a correct ordering of the transactions and updates to the ledger of blockchain, right? So if you used to like in accounting the T ledger, so the idea of, okay, there's transactions going back and forward. The blockchain is a record of all those transactions and it's done in such a way, the point is to make it immutable right now. I'll bring in a point from one of the well-known uh, scholars and philosophers uh, and uh, crypto cryptographers and computer scientists in the space. His name is Nick Zabo, and he's in fact quoted in the Bitcoin white paper. Now, he wrote a great blog post a little while ago called uh, Money, Blockchain, and Social Scalability. And so the point he was trying to make it in that article was essentially that blockchains were not chosen for their computational efficiency. They were something that helped humanity scale beyond the Dunbar number. What's the Dunbar number? It's about 150 people. It's sort of like a, it's a, it's like this idea of this is the number of relationships you can hold in your head at a reasonable level. If you go be, uh, tr too far above that, they become weaker and weaker connections. And so above that, it becomes more difficult to scale a society, right? And this is like ideas of high trust, low trust, etc. But the fundamental idea is that any time in history that somebody has had control of the money, they have had that uh, tendency to want to print, right? Because it's it's a massively beneficial power. Mm. And so what Bitcoin does is you can think of it like it's taking, it's like the Lord of the Rings, you know, we're taking that ring and we're throwing it in the fire. We're saying we're taking that ring outside the control of any one person and we're encoding it into these rules that have certain rules saying there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins, etc. So what... In that sense, blockchain was really more like a special purpose piece of technology that was used in Bitcoin in that way to help achieve this social scalability 
aspect. It's not useful in other contexts. And so what your listeners may have seen is various different projects and other non-Bitcoin uses of blockchain, which basically have not, none of them that I've seen have turned out to actually be profitable use cases of a blockchain. For the most part, it's just a lot of basically so it's like a misguided people. so it's yeah. like a record keeping interface or software what would you actually define it as in terms of its uh, functionality like sort of what group does it belong to well you i guess one way to think of it is like an append only database right i mean it's like a database that you can only add to right if you can sort of think of it like that that is probably a bit clearer way to think about it but then when you think about it from that point of view there's there's this whole group of people who are like oh blockchain technology it's like an amazing general purpose technology or whatever that we're still discovering the use cases for it blah 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 but the reality the harsh reality of it is that basically the, those things could be achieved through in more efficient ways through other technological means so are you saying that there's potentially security risk with blockchain given that it is a database that could at some point be hacked and sensitive information could get out there may be yeah there may be i mean there's this whole some of these these like misguided people who think oh yeah let's have voting on the blockchain or let's have healthcare data on the blockchain no like it just is not a good idea and so fundamentally there are other ways to achieve some of those other ideas technologically without using a blockchain and they'd be more efficient and better suited to that purpose so i think that's probably the the key thing to understand on that point that really you've got to think of it more as bitcoin not blockchain that's how i would explain it yeah uh, so i take it that you're not uh, a fan but obviously there there is a it has quite a glitzy reputation. Uh, for example, DLive, which is a live streaming uh, uh, website, uh, they promoted it as aware of a a streaming and video hosting service on the on the blockchain, as if that's like a really good thing. <laughs> so let me explain a little bit around that. So some of the let me articulate a little bit more about why blockchains are so computationally expensive. So. There's probably three main things to think about with blockchain, right? So you've got the hard drive space, you've got the CPU power, like the, the processing of it and the networking component of it. And so what Bitcoin does is if you are running a Bitcoin full node software, it means every node, every full node has to maintain a full copy of the entire ledger of Bitcoin's history, the blockchain, like the Bitcoin's blockchain, right? And so then that really starts to make you think, is that really an efficient data structure to use in other cases? And with Bitcoin, we have to understand the reason why it was chosen. It was chosen in such a way that it would be government resistant, or another way to put that is censorship resistant, right? So the only reason it is set up that way is because it needs to be censorship resistant. And it's just so unlikely to me, or almost you know, infinitesimally small possibility, that any other case other than money really makes sense for using a blockchain in this way. Now, there are certain other ideas around anchoring certain aspects of trust to Bitcoin's blockchain, but it still remains to be seen whether they are profitable and so on. I think there may be some of them that will anchor to Bitcoin's blockchain in a certain way that it actually might make sense. But some of these other blockchain technology, you put voting on the blockchain, whatever cases, no, I think they're just completely ignorant cases. So that's um, how I would uh, try to simplify it down. Yep, yeah, well, definitely you've, you know, we're about halfway through now, you've enlightened me a bit, so I think we're making good progress on the show. Now, obviously, as uh, I said in the introduction, that Bitcoin is a protector against inflation, but new Bitcoins are put into circulation, or it's called Bitcoin mining. Obviously, what what is Bitcoin mining? Who Obviously, who gets access to these new Bitcoins? Because we know in the central banking system, it's the licensed uh, banks, i.e. privileged banks that, that get all the funds first? Yeah, great question. So with Bitcoin, because 
remember, this is a decentralized network that has to achieve distributed consensus. What that means is we all have to kind of agree on what is the true ledger. And because there's no CEO of Bitcoin, there's no central server of Bitcoin, how do you do that? Now, one of the important innovations or ideas that Satoshi sort of melded together was this idea of proof of work. Now, that means all of these uh, miners around the world have to basically perform a certain amount of work. And what that, what that when I say work, and it's kind of incorrectly described when you see them say it on the media, they say, oh, it's complex equations that the Bitcoin miners are doing. It's not necessarily a complex equation. It's more like they're doing, what they're doing is called a, a SHA-256 hash function, right? That is the function that they're applying. But what it's been done, it's it's been sort of set in such a way that they have to basically brute force many, many, many SHA-256 hashes. And what are they hashing? They're hashing the transaction data in that block to try and get it under a target value known as the nonce, a number used only once. Anyway, some of that is more technical speak, but the short kind of version or the easy way to think of that is Bitcoin miners perform work done where we verify the work that they're using, using cryptography to verify that, yes, this amount of work was done. And by this lottery system, the winner of that system gets to mint the new block, which gets added to the blockchain. Now, the broader point that you were mentioning around the supply of Bitcoin. So remember, the total number of Bitcoins there will ever be is, is less than 21. It's just under 21 million, basically. And that will be reached in the year 2140. Now, in terms of the schedule, so imagine 2140 is like the asymptote. And then the supply is kind of, cur it's like an asymptote curve that's like approaching that. And so you can think of it like, uh, yeah, every, um, every, yeah. So every 10 minutes on average, a new block is found and inside that block, is contained the new block bitcoins that are awarded to the miner for successfully completing that uh, that those SHA-256 hashing I was mentioning earlier. Now, Bitcoin has this thing coded into it known as a halving. So that means every four years, the amount of new bitcoins being mined halves. So in the early days, it was being mined at 50 bitcoins per new block. So that was known as the block subsidy. Then after the halving, it was 25. Next halving, 12 and a half. So we are currently in the 12 and a half era. And then in roughly April, May next year, we'll be moving to the 6.25 uh, Bitcoins per block era. And then every four years, it'll halve. And such that, you know, the total in the year 2140 will be a little bit under 21 million. So currently, we've got about 18 million of those Bitcoins that have been issued into existence. And so basically think of it this way. The miners have an incentive to help protect the network and that in turn helps make it so that somebody else who wants to mess with the ledger by trying to rewrite history, it means it makes it harder for them to do that because they would have to compete in terms of the, that SHA-256 mining or hashing process I mentioned earlier. So the reward that miners get is two components. It is the block subsidy, right? That that part that you get uh, uh, every block. And then there's also transaction fees that if you transact on the Bitcoin network directly, you pay the miner some fee for to have your transaction included into a block. Because remember, your transaction doesn't count until it's included in a block. And not just that, what people typically want is they want their transaction to be included in a block and then the future history to get built on top of that blockchain, if you will. And so think of it, the, the best analogy I've heard on this is like amber. It's like the more you, you, co you know, the more amber that um, builds up around it, the more deeply ensconced or deeply encoded it, it, it is, if you will. Because if you do a transaction on the Bitcoin network and don't wait for those confirmations, there is a risk that that block is switched out for some other block before you know the other you know before you are able to rely on it so that's why people say when you're doing a larger transaction in bitcoin one of the old school rules of thumb was to wait for six confirmations or six blocks to be mined on the bitcoin network now look in fairness some of this stuff is 
it's getting to a technical level that most users don't really even need to get to eventually because most in in the future that we see most users won't directly interact with bitcoin's blockchain or if they do their wallet software will handle it all in the background for you i'm just trying to help you explain a little bit of what's happening under the hood right so in reality most people will be transacting using things like lightning network which is like a, which is a new technology which is think of it like it's using bitcoin but in a way that allows you to make transactions that are always able to be settled down to that base layer of bitcoin if you will and then the other part is we may see retail banks that build up on top of Bitcoin. And then let's say you, you're with one, a certain Bitcoin bank and I'm using another Bitcoin bank. You and I can transact on top of that layer without necessarily um, transacting on the base layer of Bitcoin because our banks are the ones settling to, to each other at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah, like I said, uh, you've done a, a good job of e explaining things. And yes, obviously, like you said, this is very technical, but obviously there's a lot of, well, main, you talked about how the mainstream media tries to, or how they want to explain it. And this is the thing, there's a lot of uh, fake news about uh, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency because, of course, there's the the media political complex uh, is one of the, the names that it's given is that the media, they, they don't like things that are outside the, the state. And obviously they've attacked uh, Bitcoin, for example, uh, we were talking about it before, uh, facilitating black market or illegal trades. Uh, obviously there's I'm not sure if they were accepting Bitcoin, but uh, Silk Road was the, the online, you could buy a lot of illicit drugs there. And the, the founder of that is serving something like life sentence plus 200 years, something like that. Yeah, that, they, they basically tried to make an example of him, right? A lot of other people involved with Silk Road didn't get anywhere near that sentence. He was a first time offender. They used a lot of dodgy tricks to basically make his case looked much worse than it really was and they made it they they used um they tried to say that essentially he put out a, a an assassination hit or order on people when that was never true and then later that never really got walked back in court so it, there was a lot of dodgy tricks happening around that fundamentally though i think I just want to make sure it's characterized correctly for your listeners as well. So we can think of Bitcoin not just as this incredible you know, payments technology, but let's also think of it as a savings technology because now people can save their wealth and using a Bitcoin full node, which can be run very cheaply using, say, you know, software or hardware and stuff that costs like $200, you can verify the full Bitcoin blockchain and you can be your own bank. And that means people can now start stacking sats, as we say, meaning uh, the smallest component of a Bitcoin is a Satoshi. So there's 100 million Satoshis in one Bitcoin. And so one way we talk of it is we stack sats. We're trying to accumulate uh, territory in what we think is the scarcest uh, asset uh, that we think that we you know known to man and the first time we've ever seen true digital scarcity. And so I think if if we think of it as a savings technology as well, that's another important piece of the puzzle to remember here with Bitcoin that you can now start stacking sats and nobody can stop you doing that. And if you use the correct security techniques around your Bitcoin, such as multi-signature and so on and other techniques, you can and you can back it up and you can do all these different things and in such a way that it's just very difficult for anybody to stop you transacting and being a part of that Bitcoin economy. And so that's why I spend a lot of my time trying to teach people how if they want to be part of the Bitcoin economy and you can take financial control back into your own hands by running your own full node and holding your own private keys of, of your Bitcoin, then that is how you can become a full fledged Bitcoin uh, you know, user, if you will. And obviously there's been a lot of attention to these so-called Bitcoin uh, billionaires. And obviously the, the implication of that is that it's unearned wealth. They made it through speculation and that uh, Bitcoin trading, it's, it's no different from being a, a stockbroker where uh, you're bas uh, basically, it's, it's a form of gambling on, well, it, uh, stockbroking is obviously on financial markets, but this is just obviously an internet version of that and uh, so there's been a lot of talk about uh, the bitcoin bubble there have been a few crashes but then it, it still uh, keep, it keeps going up but 
what's your interpretation of obviously the speculation in, in anything is well it's not the most economically productive uh activity so sort of how do you respond to that that there's sort of this unofficial trading market which is it, it, it's, it's not it's not fulfilling what a Bitcoin was originally meant to do, which is just facilitate peer-to-peer -peer private transactions. Right. So I think of it a little bit differently. I think, yeah, obviously the peer-to-peer -peer private transactions is obviously a big part of it. But also Satoshi himself also wrote this idea, you know, imagine a metal that was you know easy to transport around the world. And, and there was a lot of gold uh, analogies and so on used in some of those early forum posts and emails now satoshi's now gone we don't know who he is or who they he or they are um but i think that kind of digital gold idea was also there as well now the challenging part and i, I totally accept your point that there have been big kind of cycles up and down and up and down over bitcoin's history but every time it's it's come back and so people who have held for at least three or four years have pretty much always done well out of it and I think there's a reason for that. So one, it some of the more fiat economists, you know, the Keynesians of the world will come out and say, oh, Bitcoin will never, it's too volatile, it'll never be used as a medium of exchange, blah, blah, blah. But I think they're ignoring that central banks exist to try and so-called stabilize the money, right? They do, they, you know, they, that's why central banks, like part of their mandate is often, uh, it depends which central bank you're talking about, right? But they've got things like the mandate of employment and inflation and st stability of the economy or whatever, but Bitcoin has no central bank. So of course, the only way this thing can get reflected is in the price. And if we believe this thing is the hardest, soundest, best money, most saleable money, then it's on this pathway, it's a long pathway, it's, we think of it as a multi-decade pathway for adoption. And what happens is that people come to it in waves. So the first few people who came to it were the cypherpunks, right? The people who were privacy and cryptography advocates. And then the next wave was libertarians, right? And then the next wave was payments people, and then, then you know, and so on, and so on and so forth. It Each wave, if you will, it pulls in around a new round of people. And then some of those people actually dig in and understand what is going on with Bitcoin. And then they become the new base of hodlers, right? In the Bitcoin terminology, hodlers of last resort. And then it, eventually, typically we see the next halving and then that pulls another round of people in. And each time we're seeing, we're, and because we are, we're fundamentally herd animals in some ways, right? We chase the herd, it's like herd, it's like momentum chasing, right? So people start seeing the run go up and then what does that do? It triggers off these big runs up and then obviously down. But on the whole, over the long term, those people who just stack sats and just regularly accumulate small pieces of Bitcoin, they've done very well out of this. And I, the underlying thesis that we have is that we're seeing a we're seeing real time monetization of a new asset that's harder, programmatically harder than anything else. And if you think about it in that way, its inflation rate will drop even below that of gold. Or put it in other words, the stock to flow ratio of it will go higher than anything else known to man. And now we haven't got there yet, but it's going to get there. So stock, so let me just, I guess, let me back up and explain that stock to flow part. So stock is the existing amount of supply of something. The flow is the incoming amount per year. So for example, let's say, Quick example, the world had 100 tons of gold. Then uh, the annual supply of new gold mined that year is one and a half tons, so, right? And so that's about what gold's mining rate is these days. It's around one and a half to 2%. That's its uh, inflation rate, if you will, or, you know, or one over that obviously will give you the stock to flow ratio of gold. So if you try and crunch those numbers out for Bitcoin, that will show over the longer term because of these halvings that we explained earlier that bitcoin's stock to flow will go higher basically into uncharted waters it'll go into a place that no, humanity has never seen before and this is actually something really phenomenal and has never been achieved before so many of us believe that this is part of what drives bitcoin's rise to becoming someday the global money of the world I know that uh, Ron Paul, who he pretty much uh, re 
invigorated uh, libertarianism and the movement uh, worldwide he's still a a gold bug he uh, uh, he's he's still very because it is a di digital it's you described it as a digital gold but it's still digital and so obviously ron paul still sees gold because it is a precious metal where you you cannot just create more gold out of, of thin air he still uh backs investing in gold and other uh, other pr uh, precious metals for complete 100 percent confidence against inflation great point now i would say depend like depends on the view here some bitcoiners are very like they think gold is gone other people see a role for gold and bitcoin now the quick point i would want to make to your listeners here is gold is politically vulnerable it just fundamentally is vulnerable and what it what it hap what happens historically is that it tends to get stored in vaults those vaults get centralized and then the government can just go and co-opt the gold in those which vaults. they have and that's historically unfortunately yeah Mm. So that is fundamentally the technological problem, and that in that sense, that, that's why Bitcoin is a game changer. Because, as I mentioned, for about maybe 200 bucks, you can run a Bitcoin full node, and maybe for another 100 or $200, you can get a couple of hardware wallets, and you can start running multi-signature as well. So maybe total cost, let's call it 600, 700 bucks. You can start storing incredible amounts of wealth on that, on that setup and distribute the keys for that setup you right you could keep one key in a safe somewhere one key in a deposit box one key in another country even one key with your family and then if somebody tries to steal that bitcoin from you if you're using multi-signature technology it that just because they've stolen one key from you they can't take it from you because you've distributed the control for that bitcoin around the world you can't do that with gold and then the other thing to think about is that Gold can't be sent anywhere around the world for a fraction of you know the cost, right? Because gold requires you know you've got to have guards, you've got to do all this stuff, and then it requires the political will and the political um, permission to exist in that way and be used as money. Where with Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. You can just spend it anywhere, and no one can really stop you. So that is where I would say fundamentally, Bitcoin is a game changer in that. Put it this way, it stop, It helps stops counterfeiting because your Bitcoin full node, as I mentioned, that software and you know that little hardware stack that you can set up, you can run that very cheaply and you can think of that like a fake Bitcoin detector, right? So right now, if someone tried to give you fake gold, how would you know, right? You would weigh it, maybe you would use that uh, that thing that tries to detect if there's uh, tungsten inside it and yes. there's gold on the outside, right? Like those things like that. But now with Bitcoin full, full node software, you can verify it very cheaply. And with Bitcoin technology, you can secure it much cheap, much cheap, much more, you know, much more cheaply. And then you can send it anywhere around the world much more cheaply. So in that sense, that's why it's technologically a game changer. It's just taking time for people to appreciate this and understand this. Because right now, the number of people who understood just what, what I just explained to you right now is very minuscule. It's tiny. as a, It's like a, a rounding error in terms of the global population. We believe that as more people start to understand that, we'll see big, big upward movements in the price of Bitcoin and the adoption overall of Bitcoin. But I would, one other caution I would say to your listeners is to think of it like, so remember coming back to that idea of savings technology, not just payments technology, we think of it like most people are stacking sats so they can hold all, right? Because they believe this thing is gonna be worth, pick a number, 10 million per Bitcoin, 15 million per Bitcoin, you know, it, it could be more than that. So from that point of view, they would rather just save in this and they would rather spend in their Australian dollar or other fiat money. So that is fundamentally the way most kind of hardcore Bitcoiners are thinking about it. Uh, as you said before, nobody can stop you or holding Bitcoin or engaging in the Bitcoin trades, which is one of the reasons I've got you on tonight, because it's free speech money. Uh, obviously, there, there there is a bit of a, a corporatization of, well, not uh bitcoin but the whole cryptocurrency industry there's obviously digital currency exchanges now which uh, have uh deplatformed uh people for wrong things such as as coin base but in terms of the the peer-to-peer -peer, you can never because it is one person to another that can never be uh shut down and obviously uh with because i mentioned before uh 
Patreon and PayPal, which was a, it was a popular source of crowdfunding for, for independent uh, content creators. I know, I know that uh, there is now a, a, a cryptocurrency uh, crowdfunding website, uh, Bitbacker, which is, was being promoted by uh, another uh, Australian, Austro-Libertarian uh, Naomi uh, Brockwell. Uh, so a lot of a lot of Australians are, are doing uh, quite well in the the international uh, I, I would say Austro Austro libertarian uh, community, which obviously uh, I call this because the the old thing is uh, with uh, people getting their their bank accounts uh, shut uh, shut down and that obviously there's a lot of people that don't care about that and obviously social media deplatforming the response is well if you don't like it start your own social media or bank or whatever which used to be very hard but now it's relatively easy because the internet is always one step ahead i call this uh blackjack and hooker uh economics you know the the meme well i'll just create my own <laughs> you pretty much can andrew torba has he's been deplatformed every step of the way he's basically created his own blackjack and hooker like everything like isp server uh <laughs> uh own uh, payment processing everything and uh the proud boys i'm i'm not sure how much you know about them but they've been deplatformed they're pretty much creating their own of everything and obviously t the the government would like they uh, uh, they say the the internet's unregulated but most of the time that's a good thing because the startup costs are, uh, are so low and it this is why all of this is so liberating and well, bitcoin was invented 10 years ago even before this steep platforming was even thought could happen yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, Andrew Torba at Gab has used BTC Pay Server as well, which is a great Bitcoin project. And I, w I would definitely encourage your listeners who are interested in, if they want to do their own projects and things, look into BTC Pay Server. It's an open this source. This is the one like a, that um, yeah, sent me the graphic. And I noticed that yeah, it has, exactly it. the thing that attracted me was WordPress uh, integration, which obviously yeah. it's... Uh, uh, open source content management system works with uh, with WooCommerce. So if you're you're able to master uh, those content management systems, BTCP is 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 not too much of a leap. Yeah, exactly. And so I would say, oh, actually, I look, it looks oh, maybe the image is a little bit um, blurry, uh, but yeah. Anyway, like if you if you Google BTC Pay Server. Uh, I've actually done an interview series on my podcast as well with the team from BTC Pay, so listeners can check that out as well. But the key things to understand is that BTC Pay Server, you can think of it like you are, if Bitcoin is being your own bank, BTC Pay Server is like being your own payment processor. And so what it is, think of it like a technology stack and it automatically installs a bunch of these different things. It can, and then it can, it has integrations like WooCommerce integration and WordPress and so on. And it can then integrate and hook in with your website. And basically whatever the amount that somebody wants to pay in fiat. So let's say $10 Australian, right? That's the cost of the product or say you're selling a book on your website. And then once you've set up BTC pay server, you can, it will then basically, it will send your customer, it'll give your customer that option and you can send them to, it'll basically spit up a page and it'll say, hey, here's uh, $10 AUD, but in Bitcoin, right? Tr translated at the exchange rate, it'll give them an address, a Bitcoin address to pay to. And then once they've paid it, with the, they scan it and pay it with their Bitcoin wallet, then it'll uh, shut that and take them back to your site and then off you go, right? Now you've now you're being your own payment processor. And what you can do is you can use some of the different setups that BTC Pay have have got for you. So it's very easy. So you can pretty much get set up in I would say ten to fifteen minutes worth of time. Uh, it, it, basically, once you know what you're doing, um, and they've got this thing called uh, like a one-click deploy on Lunar Node, which basically sets up a VPS, virtual private server. So again, I don't want to get too technical for the listeners, otherwise it just gets a bit um, too difficult. But the basic idea is you would basically set up this VPS, which is kind of like your own hosted BTC Pay. And you would set up, you would configure it with certain things like what your Bitcoin, about your Bitcoin wallet, like you would put in your extended public keys. 
um, and then BTC Pay will then use that to generate addresses for you, right? So some so some of your listeners might have been accustomed to just using, say, a standard donation address for things, but with BTC Pay Server, you can actually generate a new address and deal with it more in a systematic way rather than using one single address for things. And using one single address for things is actually really a bad practice from a privacy point of view as well. So that's why I would really recommend listeners look into this project. It's well worthwhile. And a lot of people are using it to really free themselves from uh, the controls of government money. And it's really liberating once you have one to take payment on one as well. So that's something you can uh, look into. And it's, it really is a great answer to the problems that we are facing with fiat money, AML, sanctions, and all of these other controls and capital controls are seeing. And I mentioned the, the cryptocurrency exchanges, they charge uh, transaction fees, which any type of fee, which basically everyone thinks of it as just being siphoned off to somebody who hasn't earned it obviously btc pay zero uh transaction fee somebody just asked was that a paid uh advertisement no no it's literally i don't get paid for that i'm <laughs> it's like literally it's an open source again as i mentioned it's an open source project it's i i i i shill it for free because i use it myself and because i believe in it um so yeah i definitely recommend it and it so the thing is there are different there are different levels and models you can use within Bitcoin. There are some known as custodial model, right? Like so an exchange, for example, is a custodial right account for you. But with BTC Pay Server and with using some of these other pieces of software, you can actually hold it yourself. You can self custody your Bitcoin. And that is really the proper decentralized vision of Bitcoin that you hold your own Bitcoin using your own software and your own um uh, private keys. Uh, now I've got my next guest who's, who's currently uh, waiting, so I've got one more important uh, question. Obviously your area of expertise, you focus solely on, on Bitcoin, but there's a whole lot of other cryptocurrencies that have emerged as well. There's a whole, whole, whole other universe there, and sort of each political grouping has now got its own cryptocurrency. For, for example, Monaro, that's the one for the, the, the alt-right, and even uh, Facebook, they're seeing the benefit of cryptocurrency with their proposing uh, Libra. Uh, uh, good luck uh, <laughs> convincing any of us to, to use that, but are they, are they all the same, or do some of them have, like, holes in them, whether in terms of security or inflation? Uh, yeah, the great question. And fundamentally, Bitcoin is, is exceptional. It's, it's, the, it's the only one that's actually properly decentralized. And that's what matters in the long term. So this may sound very like, oh, I'm toxic or closed minded or whatever. And that's what typically some of these altcoin shills will uh, throw at the more uh, ardent or strident Bitcoin uh, proponents. But essentially, none of these altcoins is, has the same qualities around it. It doesn't have the same level of developers, doesn't have the same level of infrastructure, doesn't have the same network effects, doesn't have the same level of buy support. If you look on an exchange, the liquidity for the altcoins is nowhere near that of Bitcoin. And so if you look at um, how, how much slippage you would incur by trying to do a big buy or a big sell of some of these altcoins, you would move the market far more than if you tried with Bitcoin. And there's a reason for that. It's because many of these people have seen, hey, wouldn't it be cool to mint my own money? And so no, no one has really been able to topple Bitcoin because they weren't able to understand what made Bitcoin so valuable in the first place, which was actually being truly decentralized and not having a CEO, not having a benevolent founder, not having a foundation that is a controlling foundation that can basically influence the direction of that uh, altcoin and direct it to do a hard fork every six months, for example. So th there's just a few examples of why Bitcoin is exceptional and should be seen that way. And I think longer term, the truth will out, right? And you'll see that if you look back in history, there were many other altcoins and many of them don't even exist now or they're just irrelevant now because they just, they're just they tiny as a percentage of the price of Bitcoin or they're just insecure. So yeah, I, I guess that's all I can say in a very short answer, uh, but I can uh, go into further detail and I do on the podcast as well around why 
Bitcoin is exceptional. Yeah, oh, I think the explanation that you gave there was, was quite uh, uh, convincing. Uh, obviously, and of course, Bitcoin was the original so sort of imitations. The, you, a lot of the time, you can't beat the the original. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed our discussion. It was incredibly uh, informative, and I hope our audience uh, found it as well. No wonder you're one of the world's uh, best. Uh, if people want to listen to more hours and hours because that's as you said you, you could go into go uh, go into hours and hours discussion about uh, bitcoin and the various aspects of it so if people want to, to know more uh, how can they connect with your podcast well thank you yeah so it's stefanlevera.com and twitter at stefan levera so you can find my podcast by searching stefan levera podcast on the apps but basically you can find everything if you go to stefanlevera.com and uh thank you very much tim it's been a pleasure for um pleasure to chat with you yeah I, and i'd love to have you on again if there's some sort of development in in bitcoin in terms of the other cryptocurrencies i might see if i can find a alternative as you call it shill for for those uh other cryptocurrencies <laughs> to see if they can make the case uh but yeah uh take care and or hopefully we can catch up maybe because yeah like i said i only reconnected with you uh this week hopefully it won't be another sort of three years or so before we we catch up again <laughs> for sure for sure all right have a good night thank you take care Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.